The CDC has continued to measure uh, autism rates, and some of you may know that there's this thing called the Autism Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Network, ADDM, and so they've started to monitor autism rates for states all over the country. They now measure only full spectrum. They don't separate severity, so they don't know autistic full syndrome autism from Asperger's. Uh, and then they claim that they're just broadening the, the diagnostic criteria without knowing what, you know, you could control for that. So they, they started measuring full spectrum rates all over the country. Uh, interest, they picked a sample of cases. They started with New Jersey, which had rates from the very beginning of over 1 in 100, and then inexplicably they dropped New Jersey from the sample. Um, uh, and, and they started collecting data for the birth cohorts born in 1992, which is an interesting place to start history, given that we know that the rates were already going up by 1992, and if they were looking at kids born in 1988 or 1989, you might get a very different picture. But this is the picture that they developed. Clearly, the numbers are going up. And even at this point, even Tom Insel is sort of grudgingly saying, you got to say that at least part of the increase in autism rates is, is real, uh, even though we are certainly doing a better job diagnosing. Uh, I, I make a different argument which is much stronger. The rate of autism before 1930 was effectively zero. In children born in the 1990s, starting with children born in the 1990s, the rate is 1%. In some cases, in some population groups, and I'm a white male born in New Jersey. I was born in 1958. If I was born in New Jersey in 1994, uh, my risk of, of being autism would be 1 in 50, 2%. Something new and horrible is happening to a generation of children, which throws the whole theory into disarray. Because as we know, and as Dan said at the beginning, the orthodox view of autism science is that it's a, it was rare, or now it's, they're doing a better job, but constant prevalence is essential. Genetic causes are obvious. They may be complex really complex like that network diet, but, but we need a lot of money to study genes forever. The outcomes, would, any outcome that ever happens, even if there's something in the environment, it's in utero, it's not, nothing later in life can happen. It's all in the brain, in the brain compartment. And there are therapies, that there's only one thing that you can do, and that's ABA. Um, what we know now uh, is that it's an alarmingly frequent disease with rising incidence. There's no other logical, plausible argument than that it's something in the environment. Um, and there may be genetic vulnerability factors, but if you're looking at genes without looking at the environment alongside it in a gene-environment interaction, you're, you're just casting, uh, well, you're, you're, you're stupid. <laughs> uh, most importantly, these are preventable events in children who would otherwise have been normal. Um, but to get after to get after it, it's hard because you got to look. As we all know, our kids are sick; they're not defective, um, and there are many opportunities for prevention, treatment, um, and recovery. And we need to to work on those. We, we're going from you know, from a model where they're blaming our genes, you know, the, and our defective kids, to you know, to a model where the where the kids are sick. And this is these are the wars. These are the wars that we're in. We all know about them. So what about mercury? Um, I won't go into mercury in any great depth because we want to leave some time for discussion. Um, but one wonderful paper that was written that I, I wish was written before we had written chapter 10 because it's a wonderful summary and it was not something that we thought of, uh, actually looked at the evidence. Kathy DeSoto, some of you may know her work, did a very simple thing. She did a search in PubMed, autism and mercury or autism and heavy metals. Simple search, yielded little, something over 100 articles. Some of those were commentaries and editorials. Of those, uh, 58 actually had data, were studies with evidence. And she reviewed those studies, and uh, depending, you, you can actually drive the number up, but about, you know, on a three to one level, the evidence supported a role for mercury in autism. So the evidence, everyone says, oh, mercury, in autism, that's been disproven you know, many times. No, if you look at the evidence base, the evidence says it's controversial. Obviously, there are studies on the other side. Uh, but by a three-to-one margin, 
uh, the science supports a connection between autism and mercury. That's our, uh, our, um, our book in a nutshell. Um, and it's a wonderful article, a wonderful review. Um, one of the studies that's not in here, not on her list of, of 43, is another uh, wonderful exercise from the CDC, which was their first look, their first honest look at the data. Um, and we only know this because someone, for some un unknown reason, put the spreadsheets in a FOIA request. Any of you who have ever done a FOIA request know that the game with the government is to give people nothing. But for some reason, when Liz Burt made the FOIA request on mercury and autism, she got boxes full of documents. And one of them had spreadsheets with the first look of uh, the VSD database, the Vaccine Safety Data Link database. And one cut of these was to take thimerosal exposure at one month of age. Uh, they had some zero exposures, and they had some that actually had more than the hep B exposure. So these were hepatitis B Im immunoglobulin. These were kids that were getting vaccine exposures and immune globulin exposures. So they had, at one month, they had more than 25 micrograms of mercury, which is a lot. So you had a, 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 a wide spread, which is helpful in, 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 in getting through the, the noise and, the, and, and finding a signal. And in, in one of those analyses, the autism risk level was 11 times higher. In, uh, in the high exposure group relative to the zero exposure group. So that's, those are tobacco level numbers, folks. I mean, when you get, uh, and this is something that the CDC uh, came up with. As we all know, this got eventually published in Pediatrics, uh, the eventual home for all the worst science in autism. Uh, and uh, and the, the correlation had been uh, reduced to, to nothing. Uh, how did they do that? Well, one way I know that they did that is that we have a, a subsequent paper in, in which they say the following children were excluded from the analyses. Children that received hepatitis B immunoglobulin, as these were more likely to have higher exposure and outcome levels. So we just took out the data that we didn't like. It's that simple. Um, there are all kinds of other studies. Some of you may have, I, I uh, helped uh, on this paper uh, and did these charts. Um, autistic children, their first baby haircut tends to be uh, much lower than normal children because of, uh, despite the same levels of exposures. Interestingly, these normal children had extraordinarily high mercury exposures with, with uh, uh, the environmental risks that they had, but autistic children for some reason can't excrete it. And, and we also know that uh, even within the autistic group, that the most severe kids had the lowest levels of mercury in their baby hair. Um, so there are biological studies in autistic children. These are some of the studies that DeSoto mentioned. There are also animal models, and one of the things that we've been reduced to in this whole exercise is the, epi the epidemiology wars. And so the CDC will organize a epidemiology study, or public health people will organize it, or vaccine manufacturers will organize it. and uh, and they'll find that thimerosal is good for you. Actually, that's the latest one. Thimerosal is good for you. It protects you against autism. Uh, but you can also do uh, more rigorous uh, uh, scientific work in animals. Uh, the animal studies are un nearly unanimous, one exception, but uh, with one exception, completely unanimous that thimerosal at vaccine-level doses in infants is harmful.